Okay, um, so uh, today is the birthday of uh, Paolo Mendes uh, da Rocha. Uh, and uh, let's see his work. So he was born uh, on October 25th, 1928, and he's a Brazilian architect. Mendes da Rocha attended the Universidade Presbyterian Mackenzie College of Architecture, graduated in 1954, working almost exclusively in Brazil. Mendes da Rocha, Rocha, I don't know if I pronounce his name correctly, has been producing buildings since 1957, many of them built in concrete, a method some called Brazilian brutalism arguably allowing buildings to be constructed cheaply and quickly. He has contributed many notable cultural buildings to Sao Paulo and is widely credited as enhancing and uh, revitalizing the city. So this is the man. Uh, yes, a successful uh, Brazilian architect. And uh, let's see, let's see what he does. So he received the Pritzker Prize in 2006. Omendes da Rocha was professor at the Architecture College of University of Sao Paulo. Until 1998, his work is influenced by Brazilian architect Villanova Artigas from the Polish Brazilian School. He was honored with the Miss van der Rohe Prize 2000, in the year 2000, the Pritzker Prize in 2006, and the Venice Biennial Golden Lion for Lifetime Achievement 2016. So quite a, an awarded architect. So let's begin with his early works. 1957, gymnasium in the Polistano Athletics Club, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, you know, a large, a large structure and rather interesting uh, in, in concrete. Courageous uh, structurally. Um, although, in my opinion, these things are rather, rather big. I don't know if for structural reasons they need to be so big, but anyway. I have problems with uh, with the Brazilian and the Portuguese architects because they have long names uh, usually, and uh, I, uh, it's, it's sometimes hard to remember all all, all the names. Anyway, uh, the structure is elegant and interesting, with the exception perhaps that this this thing is it's, it's in my opinion quite big. But look at what is underneath. It's rather surprisingly you know, domestic with these little windows. Uh, I don't know what to think about it. The sketch is very nice and very, you know, you know, essential, reduced to, you know, essence. But uh, these things here underneath, um, they are not seen here, but they are seen here. And that, 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 it, it's, it's a strange part of the building, in my opinion. So an armchair, he also designed um, furniture, like many other architects, leather. I confess he is not one of my preferred architects, but uh, this is truly really irrelevant. Uh, anyway, uh, 1964 residential building in Sao Paulo. This one has uh, certain qualities, um, but uh, considering it's just, I think, just one apartment on, on, on one floor, 
uh, I would say is uh, dramatically elitist. Yes, it's just one apartment on, 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 on the whole floor. Uh, so how many families are here? Well, you just count the number of floors and you get the number of uh, inhabitants. Anyway, inequalities are everywhere. And so uh, they are in, in Brazil. <clears throat> when the architect is not a social worker any longer, in my opinion, there are, uh, there are problems. Because um, the architect in the name of, uh, you know, architecture and building sometimes crosses the the frontier between um, you know the things which are legitimate to do and the things which are not legitimate to do so the uh, the ethical aspects of practicing architecture should be a reality and should be considered seriously now the Bra brazil's pavilion at expo at 70 in in, in the earth 70 at osaka in osaka in japan 1969 also, uh, you know, uh, essentialist uh, structure of concrete supported, uh, you know, elegantly and minimally in just a few points. But again, when you think about the amount of uh, concrete used, um, at least from the perspective of today, uh, you would protest because, um, and this is the model, It is a tour de force, but you know the the expense of this tour de force <clears throat> perhaps should uh, make us think twice. <clears throat> a stadium in Brazil, 1973. So this is uh, you know Bra Brazilian uh, uh, you know brutalismus. I actually think sometimes the Pritzker Prize is offered a little bit uh, either easily or indiscriminately or indiscriminately. Uh, there are many architects in the world, and you know some get it, a few and many don't. If this architect is uh, one of the very best, then uh, I don't know. I mean, is he? Now, a, a chapel, 1987, in Sao Paulo. Uh, you know, not considering the big uh, problem with uh, not being uh, very well taken care of the building. Um, it has some virtues because this part seems to float, uh, you know, over the, where is the structure? So, yeah, I, but... Uh, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't look like a chapel, does it? I mean, it could have been a restaurant here quite well. But this view is more interesting, I would agree. But uh, still, you know, when you look at all that the big surface of glass, and, and this is Brazil, it's, it's warm. It's what do you do? And there is a large gathering of people that they might melt down because of the, you know, the sunlight. This kind of, you know, uh, bravado, architectural bravado, where you mimic that you you mimic that the building is actually not supporting almost supported by almost uh, anything uh, it's to me it's it's not really profound architecture i mean so what you know uh, it's a big effort but maybe for not too much maybe anyway it's just an opinion. Forma Furniture Showroom in Sao Paulo, 1987. 
Yes, there is modernity here, I would agree. Uh, and, uh, but essentially his architecture is not very complex. You know, here you have the graphic uh, signage and you know, the, I don't know if he was responsible for this. Anyway, it's, it's another room uh, with, uh, you know, uh, the Kandinsky chair and the uh, mist uh, furniture and uh, it's a showroom. And then the building is, uh, you know, floating again. Brazilian Sculpture Museum in Sao Paulo, 1988. Kind of the same architecture. The chapel was floating, uh, this uh, showroom was floating, this, um, this museum is floating. Uh, but uh, beyond this, what is here? What else is here? If life was only so simple like this, but it's not, at least in my experience. It's still a rationalist in my opinion. Uh, this is interesting, this plaza in, uh, in Sao Paulo from 1992, but it's interesting because of this suspended um, uh, roofing. Uh, otherwise, you know, the, the, the signature architecture is almost identical with what uh, we witnessed uh, uh, previously. Pinacoteca do Estado, Sao Paulo, 1993. This is nice because it has, you know, the old building and uh, all, all of a sudden there, are, there is a new dimension here at work. Um, it helps to see some bricks or some brick walls, which are not his actually, they belong to the older building here. Cultural Center for Sao Paulo, 1997. This one a little bit more uh, dramatic. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. I, I hear a noise in the background, unless you want to say something. Thank you. So it's the same, you see, he does this all the time, you know, this, uh, this kind of architecture, you know, with working underneath and then a huge uh, horizontal uh, beam, uh, you know, uh, which is the building itself supported at the sides. That's kind of it. National Coaches Museum in Lisbon in Portugal, 1915, the same. <laughs> The same, you know, it's very easy to, to recognize a building by him. Now there are other architects who were kind of like this. Anyway, here at least we have this surprise, surprise, let's call it a surprise, but I don't think his architecture is, is, is so complex. It's more complex what I see here, but that's not by him. Or at least formally, maybe, maybe it's not complex either, it's just the appearance could be. Here we have this uh, structural, uh, you know, tour de force with the, which comes maybe from Miss van der Rohe uh, in a way, you know, if we recall the Museum of Contemporary Art in, in Berlin. Um, 
the National Gallery in Berlin. Anyway, this is in Portugal by uh, this Brazilian architect who was uh, spoiled with uh, uh, you know, the most important prizes in architecture. Now a house in Lisbon, again, 2017. Um, yeah, it is modern, obviously, uh, but uh, I don't know. I mean, there are many houses like this. It's not that, you know, this house is uh, it's a kind of a mainstream architecture, in my opinion. I almost like more the traditional buildings around it. And yes, of course, you know, uh, you can imagine who can de who deserves, not who deserves, but who can afford, you know, to bring water this uh, height and uh, just for the pleasure of two, three people. Um, so it's not for everybody, obviously, nor this uh, opulent living room. This is the house, the existing house, and he just built above it. I don't know what this is, 2017, again in Sao Paulo. Here again, uh, a major effort with uh, some extravagances. And the, the most extravagant thing is the, the swimming pool at the top. Now in Brazil, there are many inequalities and uh, there are many problems still, uh, even if Brazil is, uh, uh, its economy is not, it's not, you know, one of the poorest in the world. It's not, but still, you know, to put a swimming pool on top of the building to me is uh, an invitation to ignore what we call today sustainability. I mean, this is like, like a health club, you know, who goes to this health club, you can imagine. Yes, you can take uh, interesting pictures of almost any building. So you can take in interesting pictures here as well. It's okay. It's an okay architecture, but I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, addressing the ethical problems, but uh, you know, let's say the aesthetical problems, the architectural problems. But I don't think we should ignore certain ethical aspects. Anyway, people seem to enjoy it. You know, people will, will do anything but, you know, remain uh, still. They can't, we can't, we have to climb on things, on walls or whatever. A lot of glass, you know, I mean, <laughs> to me, I, I'm a little tired actually of this kind of architecture. You know, we just uh, splash glass, glass, glass again. The larger the surface is, the better. And then we pump uh, air conditioning, of course. And then people enjoy themselves at the top of the building, but to bring that water, you know, because this is not rainwater, to bring that water at this level, uh, machinery is required and uh, an effort and uh, energy consumption and so on. But 
the architect doesn't care too much. Okay, let's go now to the second architect today. Uh, let's start, to, uh, I'll start with, I, we have two choices. With Henri, Henri van der Velt, uh, well, they say that this is the Dutch pronunciation, but he's actually considered a, a Bel Belgian architect and quite an important architect for uh, uh, modernity, considered one of the fathers of Art Nouveau. Uh, and uh, he had a, a complex figure, Henri van der Velt. So let's uh, read first a few things about him. Henri Clemens van der Velt, um, he actually died. Uh, here is written the 15th, but on other sides, it's written the 25th of October, and that's why we talk about him today. Was a Belgian painter, architect, interior designer, and art theorist. Together with Victor Horta and Paul Hankar, he's considered one of, the, one of the founders of Art Nouveau in Belgium. He worked in Paris with Samuel Bing, the founder of the first gallery of Art Nouveau in Paris. Van der Velt spent the most important part of his career in Germany and became a major figure in the German Jugendstil. He had a decisive influence on German architecture and design at the beginning of the 20th century. So this was the man. Interesting, uh, is it a kitchen? Maybe, uh, looks like it, but uh, there is a bed there and you know, <laughs> the cook is dressed uh, as an architect. Uh, here is the architect again, all alone, contemplating, I don't know what. Drawings, drawings by, by uh, Van der Velt. I like this uh, quotation from him, a line is a force. Henri van der Velt, a nice uh, little line. I mean, a line is a force. It is, or could be. Although Louis Kahn saw that the first line on a white piece of paper is already less because the, the, the infinite of the whiteness of paper is already you know, crippled, so to speak. A proposal for a Nietzsche memorial. And the Nietzsche and it is, it was not built, but uh, we'll see something else uh, relating to this, an interior room that he did for Nietzsche. He also did artworks like this one. So these are just uh, drawings, renderings, uh, sketches, uh, artworks, and so on. So he was not just an architect. Uh, as I read at the beginning, he did many things art, uh, you know, even theory, furniture design, uh, buildings and so on. We are going to see his built works. Uh, this is rather interesting. It could have been in a, you know, maybe even in a, in a James Bond uh, movie, architecture. Uh, Bremen Werth, 1895, 1896, uh, the first private residence in Uckel, Belgium. And uh, here it is. It, it has some idiosyncratic newness about it. It's not just tradition, but, uh, you know, it was still the, the turn of the century, the 19th century. and. Uh, you know, the, the new didn't yet show up in full force. It 
depressingly alone. <laughs> well, or maybe his collaborators were hidden in some other room. An interior decoration of uh, this man, Bing's art gallery in Paris, Maison de l'Art Nouveau, the house of, of, of uh, you know, Jugendstil or the Nouveau or l'Art Nouveau in Paris. Um, I don't know if I have bigger pictures of this. Now, unfortunately, it's an early work by him. The interior of this museum in Hagen in Germany, no pictures, then Villa S S K in Chemnitz, Germany, uh, 1902, 03 to 1911. This is an interesting building because it's hybrid. It's, uh, uh, you know, it, it escapes a sim simple, uh, you know, approach or description. It is heterogeneous. And the use of color is important because here we have two colors which are almost opposite to each other, the yellow with, with the blue. Well, it could have been the orange with the blue, but uh, it, they are, and there is uh, the dynamics of this contrast between um, you know, oppo almost opposite colors is uh, something uh, that animates the building. Rather dramatic interior. You wouldn't expect in a private house something like this. Interesting uh, gateway, you know. Uh, here you see already, you know, uh, an, uh, the the Jugendstil or Art Nouveau uh, elements. Now an extension, an interior decoration of the Nietzsche archive in Weimar, uh, from Germany, 1903. So he did just the interior room. But it, yeah, it's comfortable. It's uh, you know, it's a public space. In what way this is a room dedicated to, you know, in a narrative way to Nietzsche? I don't know. It's a bourgeois, it's a bourgeois room in a way. Uh, perhaps Nietzsche would have protested, or maybe not. Who knows? One thing is for sure: this is not a space for Zarathustra. The Bauhaus University, and this is interesting because we think of the Bauhaus usually based on the buildings built by Walter Gropius in Dessau, but, but, the, but the Bauhaus started in Weimar in 1919, and he actually built the building. And in my opinion, the building by Van der Velt is in no way inferior to the building by Walter Gropius. This is the building. It's a building which is not so radical, it's true, because it has sloping roof. But look at the, you know, the, 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 the glass parts, I think, are, I don't know, for my taste, maybe I am a traditionalist myself, although I don't think I am. But uh, really, it would be interesting to compare this building with a new building in Dessau by, uh, by Walter Gropius. And I'm, I'm not sure the one by Walter Gropius would be, uh, uh, you know, legitimately uh, considered better or superior. Because here there are, there is still, you know, I mean, even this side, side elevation, it, it has, 
it has some some interest you know it's not it's not banal So again, this is the building, the first building where the Bauhaus was active from 1919 onwards, and it was by, done by um, uh, Van der Welt. And it exists. Uh, these are, you know, almost uh, contemporary pictures. The clubhouse of the Chemnitzer Lawn Tennis Club, it was demolished. I don't know if I have pictures, I do. Let's see it. Not bad. I like this building and I regret it was demolished. And you see, it has a certain complexity, you know, these parts here, you know, with the lighting and then the decorations on this wall. A mansion for Karl Ernst Othaus in Hagen, 1907-1908, and mansion it is. But really, his architecture is not bad. This is uh, he was announcing modernity, but he also was, uh, you know, inspiring himself from from his time. quite a big house, a mansion as it was called. Okay, so uh, makes me think a little bit of the, the own house, I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright's own house and studio in Oak Park, a little bit. Not with such, uh, um, you know, balconies and such a parapet, uh, but uh, more like with the articulation of the volumes. Now, uh, a private residence in Weimar from 1907-1908, uh, similar to what we saw, uh, smaller. But not much smaller, actually. Anyway, the IV on the wall is always a plus. I keep telling students, if, if the elevation of your buildings doesn't uh, arrive at what you would like it to arrive, you just bring in the IV and it will take care of it. Uh, you can make a good elevation of any building if you just bring in the IV.
I imagine even the avant-gardists would love to live in such a house, which is, uh, you know, opulent and uh, domestic and bourgeois and so on. Anyway, uh, now a memorial for Ernst. I don't know who this person is in collaboration with these sculptors. Uh, Max Klinger, a, a brilliant artist, actually, Max Klinger. I don't know about Konstantin Manier. And here it is. Happy. As maybe a memorial should be, maybe. Now you look at this building and you look at this building and you wonder, is this a progress uh, in relationship with this one? I'm not convinced, <laughs> but uh, anyway, we moved in this direction as we all know. That is for Graf Birkheim in Weimar, 1912-1913. It's, uh, you know, sorry, uh, okay, this is the building. Now the Werkbund Theater, which was built at the Deutsche Werkbund uh, exhibition in Köln, Cologne in Germany, didn't leave for more than a few months. It was built and then the war started. And, uh, but before the war started, I think, it, because maybe because of the war was starting, it was destroyed, this building. and. Not just this building, but also an important building by Bruno Taut, uh, the glass pavilion, the glass house, and also uh, a very important building by Walter Gropius. And maybe there were, I'm sure there were other, other buildings. Um, everything was destroyed. And uh, again, another proof of the magnitude or amplitude uh, of, the, um, of, 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 of the brains and heart of homo sapiens. Why are we building these buildings in order to destroy them in a few months? Teatro Werkbund Henry van der Welt in Köln, in, in Cologne, in Germany. We have some pictures now, but the, the, the the building is gone. And the plan is, is, you know, very conventional. But the building has some interesting things. It's just that it doesn't exist any longer. A villa from Gera in Germany, 1913, 1914. Uh, what can we say? Another villa.
another building from the same time, the same kind of architecture actually. Milano Belmaison, uh, his own private residence in Belgium in Terburen, 1927-1928. So at almost the same time when Le Corbusier built Villa Savoie. This is less radical, is, uh, but it has subtle things. If you study more carefully, you realize it's not, uh, it's not uh, as banal as you might think at the first sight. Sometimes I wish Villa Savoie had some bricks in it too, but it doesn't. If not on the walls, then on the floor somewhere. It even made it to a, to a stamp. Well, the architect and behind him, his own house. Home for the elderly uh, in, in Germany, 1929-1931 is a building that I like. You know, it's a public building, but with, um, you know, uh, well-built uh, brick walls and uh, a tellurical building. Yet with the modernity of, you know, almost continuous horizontal uh, window. Interesting what's going on here and here and here and here. They, these are not, uh, uh, you know, accidents or no, they are part of the design, but I think they are rather interesting. A polyclinic and villa lending for this doctor, 1933-1935, also in Belgium. the building from the time and the cars from our time. Now this library is interesting because it's symbolically uh, emphatic you know, it shows the power of knowledge, the tower of books, and here it is. <laughs> Not too many towers of books in the world, but here we have it.
Now, if knowledge was as uh, solid uh, as this tower is, I don't know, would, would, would it be a, a good thing? Would it be a bad thing? If knowledge is, is essentially uh, centered on, on questions, not so much on answers, then maybe it shouldn't have such a, a robust uh, solidity, maybe. I like the lobby, the interest lobby. Here it is. A school from I don't know if he did everything here because this looks different from, from what we have here. This seems to be more recent. Interesting structural uh, acrobatics here. The Belgian Pavilion in 1937 and the Paris exhibition. You see Tour Eiffel on the right side. A train station. Also Belgium. Paris, 1937, the Bells for Peace. Uh, I don't know where they are, but uh, I like, I think we need more Bells for Peace in the world. Maybe this tower at the top. Where else? Maybe that the building was transported to some other country, I think in Africa, because there is a, um, description with with some words in this in this sense And some furniture design, and with this we end the presentation of Harry van der Velt. He designed many pieces of furniture, and I think quite interesting and comfortable, you know, almost provocative a little bit with the design, particularly for the time when they were built. Not a bad uh, desk, I confess. I wouldn't mind having such a desk, but such a desk probably costs more than a, than a villa, a small size villa. Let's not exaggerate. I wonder if, uh, well, no, no, I don't wonder. I, uh, you know, uh, a strange thought visited my mind. Why wouldn't IKEA, uh, you know, uh, manufacture, uh, you know, we have furniture of this sort. It would be very expensive, of course, compared to 
their, their designs. A nice chair. Very nice chair, actually. And paintings, because he also painted, influenced by Vincent van Gogh, uh, you know, a prolific man with many interests. This is actually by Seurat, I imagine, or he was influenced by Seurat. Yes, he was influenced by Seurat, by Pontilism. I don't think he was a very original uh, painter. He had influences, but uh, it's not, I mean, look here, yeah, we almost see the sky, the famous sky by, by Van Gogh. So he was not very original as a painter, but it is remarkable that doing so many other things, building buildings, uh, graphic works, he also found time to, uh, this is after, after Vincent Van Gogh, uh, time to uh, paint. Okay, so um, let's go now to the third one. Uh, here is a, sh a shorter presentation uh, on, uh, just a second, please. On Sven Markelius. Okay. So he was born. Let's see. Uh, let's let's read a little bit of a text uh, about him. So he was born on the twenty fifth of October. He was a Swedish modernist architect. Markelius played an important role in the post-war urban planning of Stockholm. For example, in the creation of the model suburbs of Ullingby and Farsta, nineteen sixty. Here is the man. Here was the man. I think he was also a diplomat at some point, at least. An accomplished man uh, in, 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 various, uh, in various fields. He didn't build so much, but we are going to see some things built by him. And also interesting textiles. The student union at the Royal Institute of Technology. The student union was founded on November 1901. The union building was designed by leading Swedish modernist, you know, her and, and Sven Markelius in 1928 and inaugurated in 1930. It is significant as one of the first examples of modern architecture in Sweden and has the status as a listed building. Here it is, this one. It doesn't look exceptional from, from this time, but at that time, I guess it was uh, maybe almost shocking. The Helsingborg Concert Hall completed in 1934. So this is Sven Markelius, the Swedish uh, architect. The sculptures are not his. It's a famous uh, sculptor, the Swedish sculptor. Somehow, you know, I like very much the presence of the sculptures because uh, they animate everything, you know, together with the water. The building might, might need some animation too, I, I would say. Sven Markelius. A villa, his own, in Stockholm, 1933. Whiteness, of course, because whiteness was and is still considered in some circles, at least, as being so-called modern. Sven Markelius in Stockholm, his own house.
so the, sorry for the picture is an old picture but uh, you still have an idea about the, the interior spaces of this house the exterior is more modern than the interior Interesting, this light here. I never saw one like this before. Another villa, this one more uh, subdued and more so-called traditional. Here he had a different client than himself. Very, very reticent uh, architecture. And in, 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 uh, in Sweden, uh, very rarely you see some, you know, a little bit extravagant uh, architecture. Usually it's a very, very reticent architecture. And something this, this is not necessarily bad, I would say. The Stockholm Collective House from 1935. Uh, strikingly modern even uh, by today's standards. With a collective uh, kitchen, you know, a common, uh, a common uh, kitchen, you know, where neighbors would meet and cook together and eat together. And I think it's a good idea. Well, considering uh, a time without the pandemic, this kind of collectivism, I think, is a good thing. Again, when uh, the time allows for something like this. There were experiments in this sense in Russia or Soviet Union, should I say. Uh, and I, I, I think they are coming back. This, this kind of the, the idea to have a, a block of flats with uh, private spaces, but also collective spaces, common spaces. Another villa, 1937, modern through and through, but not so much the interior and not so much the furniture. The Swedish Pavilion in 1939, New York's World's Fair. Um, yeah, I don't know. I hope I have better pictures. No, I don't. Um, sorry. Modernistic, uh, airy, uh, you know, open, 
țării democratic. I wonder, you know, if they felt at that time, you know, that the, the tragedy of the Second World War would, would happen. Now, the United Nations Economic and Social Council interior, which was a gift given to the United States from Sweden, and it was done by uh, Sven Markelius, an important uh, room within the, the United Nations building. Sweden House at, uh, I don't know what this is, 1961, of the five, uh, one of the five glass get buildings in Stockholm is a good building. Uh, one of these was built by him. I don't know who built the others, but uh, I think they are uh, more than decent. I think they have elegance and they are even monumental. Uh, and I like the fact that the, the glass is, uh, you know, yes, it's horizontal, but also vertical and fragmented, smaller, smaller surfaces of glass. I mean, there is a lot of glass, a, small, a lot of windows, but small windows. Stockholm. And now we end this presentation with the furniture designs and also some uh, textile works he did. The stacking chairs, as you can see, architects uh, design a lot of furniture, not just buildings. This stack in a very you know, complex and rich way solid wood. Elegant design, you know, with this uh, slight uh, opening so you can actually lift the chair. So these details matter, they do matter. Here again, you know, to, to be able to lift the chair in this way. And it looks like a very stable chair. Now we end, we truly end with the textile designs, the Pythagoras, I don't know why they are called so, maybe because they are based on geometry. Uh, I admire always textiles and uh, people who, you know, architects or not, who also designs textiles. I don't know if you know, but Le Corbusier also designed textiles. And uh, I don't know if I have some samples of Le Corbusier's uh, textiles here. Anyway, this is what Knut Hamsun, uh, Knut, not Knut Hamsun was, a, was a, an important Norwegian uh, writer, sorry for, uh, who received the Nobel Prize in Italy, just sorry for uh, not saying uh, Sven Markelius. So Sven Markelius textile works.
but there is also the influence of the folk culture of his own country, meaning Sweden. Abstracted, of course. Thank you.